hearing me sing those Korean songs. Those have nothing to do with Jesus. <laughs> so, um, if I do write one about Jesus in Korean, maybe, maybe I'll share that one day. But regardless, welcome. Uh, it's good to, to see you guys, good to see some, some new faces. And uh, yeah, we're going to continue on in what we've been doing. So, I've been going through the book of Nehemiah for quite some time, and we're almost, almost at the end. Uh, but unfortunately, there have been so many different events that, you know, it's, it's, it's been kind of a little bit out of rhythm. Uh, next week, too, we actually have a guest speaker. We have a missionary coming. Next Sunday is Missionary Sunday at our church. Our church has been very centered on sending out missionaries because we commissioned our first missionary within the first year of the church. This was more than 40 years ago. And so it's been a very large history at this church. And so Missionary Sunday, all pulpits are, are um, preached by missionaries. And so we have a missionary coming. I actually know his son. Um, and so I met up with him actually last Sunday. And so I'm looking forward to that. But actually, next Sunday evening, we're having our first retirement service. So, you know, we've been sending out missionaries for more than 40 years, and some of them have hit the age of retirement. And so we're having our first retirement service for missionaries next Sunday. It's all in Korean, um, but regardless, if you're interested, uh, check it out. Uh, my uncle, uh, the founder of this church, will be speaking, and uh, there's going to be a lot of things involved. My dad's actually considering coming. That's how important it is to him. But regardless, um, he knows some of those missionaries. But regardless, uh, yeah. Uh, next Sunday is something to look forward to, but we are still in Nehemiah, but we're almost done. Okay, with that said, you know, we just had a, just a wonderful time of worship, but what kind of worship song do you like? Right? How you answer this, I think, will kind of dictate how old you are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, you know, I actually remember when drums first came into the church. And like people were people were freaking out. Right? People were like, "Oh my goodness, that's devil music!" Right? That was like, it was like drums coming into the that was a big deal. And then not long after, there was electric guitars and people were playing solos and we're like, "What's going on? It's like a rock concert, right?" And so I know for modern worship today, it's it's all full band. Right? You have your drums, you have your bass, you have your electric guitar. Um, but then you know. Our main church being a bit of an old-fashioned church, you know, we have the generations that feel like worship is only hymns, right? Um, that if it's not in the chum zone, then you know it's it's not worth singing, right? So like, um, so there's many uh, that 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 kind of come from the tradition of seeing the songs, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago, and those songs have a lot of richness. Actually, I love the lyrics of hymns because in in a very uh, you know short. You know, like a very short stanza, it basically dictates like, like, like all of redemption, like Jesus Christ, the gospel. It's packed, right? Whereas I think a lot of the songs we sing today, we're repeating like this, this one little phrase over and over again. Right? So it's different, it's right? It's okay. God bless you. It's okay. It's okay. But I think one of the ironies to me too is the generations that only like hymns, they actually forget that. Hymns were, they used to be bar songs. So when people, like, the original praise is like chanting, right? And then later, when, when they came out with the, what we know as hymns today, they took melodies from the bar, right? And they put Christian lyrics to it. So to me, it's funny because people who think that hymns are like these holy songs that were like, that are untouchable, back when they came out, they were, I'm sure they were controversial as well. So... Every generation that has their own version of praise, it always meets controversy. But brothers and sisters, that's not the most important thing, right? The most important thing is that God is worshipped, God is praised. And ultimately, I, I really feel like every generation needs to be singing new songs, right? It's biblical, right? I sing a new song unto the Lord. We can never stop writing songs. We can never stop worshipping God in different ways. So all that said... I felt like I was preaching this. this <laughs> um, now, I'm going to bear, bear with me because we're going through two chapters, but I'm skipping a lot of the names because honestly, I don't think that's going to bless anybody. Um, but I'm skipping a lot of the names, but uh, yeah, bear with me. This is a long passage. Nehemiah, starting from chapter 11, we're going to go through chapter 12. Um, but Nehemiah, chapter 11, from verse 1 of your Bible, smartphone, or look at the screen, where the Lord says this. Now, the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. 
The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every ten of them to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. The people commended all who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. These are the provincial leaders who settled in Jerusalem. Now some Israelites, priests, Levites, temple servants, and descendants of Solomon's servants lived in the towns of Judah each on their own property in the various towns, while other people from both Judah and Benjamin lived in Jerusalem, from the descendants of Judah, blah, 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 blah. From the descendants of Benjamin, blah, blah, blah. From the priests, from the Levites, the gatekeepers. The chief officer of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzi, son of Bani, the, the son of Hashabiah, the son of uh, Mataniah, the son of Micah, Uzi was one of Asaph's descendants, who were the mu musicians responsible for the service of the house of God. The musicians were under the king's orders, which regulated their daily activity. Chapter 12. These were the priests and Levites who returned with Zerubbabel, son of Shiltel, and with Joshua. Uh, and Joshua. It's a long list of names. Uh, from verse 24. And the leaders of the Levites were Hashabiah, Sherebiah, Jeshua, son of Cadmiel, and their associates who stood opposite them to give praise and thanksgiving, one section responding to the other, as prescribed by David, the man of God. Mataniah, uh, Bapukia, Obadiah, Meshulam, Talmud, and Akub were gatekeepers who guarded the storerooms at the gates. They served in the days of Joachim, son of Joshua, the son of Josedak, and in the days of Nehemiah the governor, and of Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. The musicians also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the uh, Netophathites, from Beth Gilgal, and from the area of Geba and Asmaveth, for the musicians had built vi villages for themselves around Jerusalem. When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right toward the Dung Gate, Hoshahiah, and half the leaders of Judah followed them, along with Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, uh, Jeremiah, as well as some priests with trumpets, and also Zechariah, son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of uh, Micaiah, the son of Zakor, the son of Asaph, and his associates, Shemaiah, uh, Azrael, uh, Milalai, uh, Gilalai, Mai, Mai, uh, Nethanel, Judah, and Hanani, with musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God. As for the teacher of the law, led the procession. At the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps of the city of David on the ascent to the wall and passed above the site of David's palace to the water gate on the east. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall, together with half the people, past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, over the gate of Ephraim, the, uh, the Jeshana gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate, and at the gate of the guard they stopped. The, the two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God. So did I, together with half the officials, as well as the priests, Eliakim, Maaseah, um, Neamin, uh, Micaiah, Elio, <laughs> uh, Zechariah, and Hananiah with their trumpets, and also Maaseah, uh, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzi, Jehona, uh, Malkajah, Elam, and Ezer. The choirs sang under the direction of Jezrahiah. And on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The men and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits, and tithes. From the fields around the towns, they were to bring into the storerooms the portions required by the law for the priests and, and the Levites. For Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and Levites. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did also the musicians and gatekeepers, according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there had been directors for the musicians and for the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So in the days of Zerubbabel and of Nehemiah, 
All Israel contributed the daily portion for the musicians and the gatekeepers. They also set aside the portion for the other Levites, and the Levites set aside the portion for the descendants of Aaron. Amen. Um, long passage. I skipped a lot of names. There were still a lot of names, but praise the Lord, we are done with that passage. Uh, but moving on, this 2019, our theme is one of holiness, understanding that God is holy and that we as His people are called to be like Him, to be holy, to be set apart. And so our hope for this year is to understand a little bit more of what that is. Our theme for 2020 will be one of victory. Okay. Uh, so be excited about that as, as you seek holiness that God will lead you into a year of victory as well. Uh, we've been going through the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a very practical, practical example of what holiness looks like. This was not a prophet. This was not a priest. So this is not a holy man. He was a man that had been put in a government place where he could influence the king of Persia. And so God used him. And this is a man of prayer. And through prayer, he saw that God was allowing him to, to, to get favor from the king and to rebuild the walls. Why? Because even the temple, even though the temple had been rebuilt, worship was not restored. There was no safety. There was no separation. So the walls needed to be rebuilt to, to protect Jerusalem, but to also restore worship. And so we see that he, he went through all sorts of things, but we took a long detour because what happened was, after they finally built the wall, what did they do? They went to the Word of God. And for many, this was the first time they ever heard the Word of God. Many of them had forgotten Hebrew because many generations had passed. And so now they are hearing what the Word of God really is. And it's transforming them. It's encouraging them. It's convicting them of their sin. And they made a vow and they said... Lord, we will do this from now on. We will follow your word, and we will do these things. Oh. <laughs> and so with that, going into this now, they, they've been confronted and challenged and transformed by the word of God, and now we're going into this latter part where now we see that it's time to repopulate the city. Okay, So this city has been basically deserted for, for many, many years. And without a wall, there was no protection. But now as you look in the text, the leaders of the people plus 10% of the people were chosen. Right? They were chosen to go back into the city. Now you have to understand that this was a great sacrifice. It was much easier to live outside where there's land, right? To us now, this might not make sense because for us, living in a city might be more convenient. Right? You just go outside, you, know, you go to the Pilnage you know, you buy some stuff, you just live. But, but back then, they didn't have that kind of stuff. Back then, you lived off the land, right? So if you had land, you could plant, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables. You could you could raise animals, and that's how you survived. You lived off the land. So to live in the city was a sacrifice because now you depended on other people to survive. But this had to happen because if people didn't live in the city, it would go to ruin. So they decide by drawing lots. Now let me let me help you understand. Cho choosing by lot to us seems like gambling. <laughs> but back then, they believed that this is, okay, this is God's will, right? So, you know, we do like the little, well, the bulky, like the little straw. <laughs> like, you know, if you, if you do that back then, their understanding is, oh, okay, it's the will of God, then I must do this. And so they decided, and 10%, right? We understand that there are maybe around 50,000 people. So we're talking about 5,000 people were going to live in a city that could, that could house like maybe like 300,000. This was a great sacrifice. And yet they did it willingly because they felt they had been chosen by God. He had a lot of people. Um, and then when we look at the list of names, it starts off with Judah and Benjamin. The reason why is because the city of Jerusalem was in the land of Judah and Benjamin. But then the list focuses on priests, Levites, i.e. musicians and gatekeepers. Actually, all of these people are Levites. For some of us, when we think of Levites, we think of priests. But priests are only a small group within the Levites. Musicians, temple musicians, were Levites. Gatekeepers were Levites. The treasurers, everyone focused in some type of aspect of running the temple of God, they were all Levites. So the list that was in chapter 11 and 12 is almost primarily Levites. And explaining that this is the central 
portion of people that had an important, uh, important role in the city of Jerusalem. So what that tells us is that worship was central. Worship was primary. It was a small group of people that lived in the city, but the most important roles were those that were involved with leading worship in the temple of Jerusalem. Worship is central. Worship is important. So then, there's a long list talking about gatekeepers and musicians. And this sounds kind of weird, because the interesting thing is, this emphasis on gatekeepers and musicians is not just in this chapter. You look at 1 Chronicles 25 and 26, they're right next to each other. So for some reason, there is a uh, some type of relationship between gatekeepers and musicians. And I'm going to try my best to explain what I think it is in our current context. Okay? So, they talk a lot about the sons of Asaph, right? And now, some of you who are familiar with the Bible, you might have heard the term Asaph before. Why? Because Asaph wrote Psalms, right? He wrote Psalm 50 and Psalms uh, 73 to 83. And so, you'll see those are the Psalms of Asaph. And if you know other parts of the Bible, you'll also know that Asaph was a musician, right? He was a very talented musician. And he, he was a Levite as well. So he wasn't from the priest line of Levites, but he was from the line of Levites that worshiped God through music. Now, one of the funny things for me, and I, I think it's probably just for me because of my age, but if you actually look at the text where it talks about Asaph, he worked under this man named Heman. And so for me, I just laugh because I see no. For me, ha So there's a guy named He-Man in the Bible. But regardless, a lot of you guys don't have no idea who He-Man is. It's okay. Dun, 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 dun. But that's okay. Um, um, Asif was a talented musician, and he was given a special job. Out of all the musicians, David set apart Asif and his sons to lead the worship in the temple. All the services in the temple, in the presence of God Himself. This is a very, very important role. And not just leading worship, they were they were meant to prophesy, right? So that's why Asaph himself wrote a bunch of psalms. He was proclaiming the words of God through music. This is a man with a gift not only of musical talent, but of proclaiming the word of God through these lyrics that he wrote through his music. Interestingly enough, Asaph actually lived through both reigns of David and Solomon. And so a lot of people find it interesting because if you look at the Psalms of Asaph, you see someone who is hoping for this, this, uh, this next king, right? He, he was placing his hope into Solomon. And then he was quickly disappointed. Because if you really know the Bible, Solomon is not that great of a king. He did build the temple, but he, everything else was bad. And so Asaph kind of he went through, I'm sure he went through depression because he, he was serving David and he was looking forward to, to, to serving with his son and then his son is like, you know, it's a piece of junk. <laughs> he wasn't the one that was th to come, right? Regardless, when it talks about the sons of Asaph, it's the people that are coming from his generation who, like him, have the same job, leading worship and prophesying in the temple of God. And so, who would we look at as today's sons of Asaph? Right? Who would this be to us? Now, I just put up a bunch of random pictures here. Um, these are these are the the current like uh, like main worship leaders like today, right? Like the like kind of the main. You got Darlene Check up in the upper corner. You got Chris Tomlin, little short guy down there. Um, Matt Redman, my goodness, he's gaining a lot of weight. If you look at his new pictures together, oh my goodness, Matt, calm down. Um, you got Brooke Legertwood uh, in the bottom right. I put Kim Walker in the center, um, mainly because our own Joyce is compared to Kim Walker. And Kim Walker looks like just like this nice little lady, but if you hear her lead worship, it's kind of scary. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh, I'm being terrified into the presence of God. <laughs> but she has a very powerful, powerful voice, right? <laughs> and so, so yeah, like Joyce's nickname since I knew her back when she had just graduated high school was Korean Kim Walker. Um, but regardless, these are the people that I would compare to as the sons of Asaph of today. 
those that are in the place of leading worship, creating psalms, prophesying, proclaiming the word of God through their psalms, and leading people into worship. Right? These are the people that, and, and the thing that you have to really take note of is that these people were were supported by the like by the people of Israel. Right? This was their full time job. The sons of Asaph, that was their job. And in the same way, this is their profession. Now, who are today's gatekeepers? This one was a little bit harder. Um, gatekeepers, if you really look at the text, it seems they're more like, like literally like guarding the door because there's treasure and stuff in the, in the different areas. And there's different areas of God that like, or different areas of the temple that certain people aren't allowed into, right? You have to be a priest. You know, you have to be the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies. They were guarding those type of gates and those doors. But to me, you know, I look at the welcoming team. And so the reason why is because like the, the gatekeepers of old, these are the first person you encounter when you're coming into a place of worship. Now for me, this has a special place in my heart because I, I've been on welcoming team almost from the very beginning. When I was in high school, when I was a little like junior in, in high school, the first role I was given in youth group was I was the trouble guy, right? <laughs> I was the guy handing out the bulletins. I did this for two years, faithfully. Um, and then, you know, I kind of forgot about that. But I, like, you know, when I was doing it, I made, I made it fun, right? I was like, give high fives, you know, and, and, and you, you make it fun. But then, back when I was in seminary and I was serving at Jubilee Church, uh, they hired me as the welcoming pastor. And so again, I'm doing the same thing. I'm handing out bulletins, I'm high-fiving people. Um, and, and, you know, at a church like Jubilee, where it's a congregation that keeps changing. This is true for any English ministry. It's true for us, but I think at that church it's a little bit worse in terms of how quickly people turn over. Because at that ministry when I was there, there would be 500 people every every day, right? Every Sunday. But within one year, that 500, 70% of them would be different. Right? So that's how much turnover goes on in those types of ministries. And so for me, as the welcoming pastor, I took on the task of, you know what, I'm going to try to memorize everybody's name. So when there's 500 people and it's turning over 70% every year, you're talking about more like a thousand names that I got to memorize, right? I think at my peak, I got up to about 65 to 75, uh, 65 to 70 percent of the names that I could say as, as they came in. And one of the things that encouraged me when I did this, there was a brother, man, it's, it's brother John, and I happened to remember his name. Part of it was because um, he's an Ivy Leaguer, and I'm an Ivy Leaguer, so I was a little, I was a little, I was a little snobby. So yeah, you know, you know, this Ivy League snob in me remembers of the other Ivy Leaguers, and so I remembered his name. And he told me, because he was coming from far away, and it took like an hour and a half to get to church. He told me the reason why I came back was because I remembered his name. And then later on, he became like the choir director. So I was like really proud of this, right? <laughs> but, 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 you know, one of the things that, that I, I really want to make clear about welcoming is that, you know, some of you, this might be your first time here. And you don't know anybody. This is one, that's one of the most awkward experiences, like, period, right? It's like, it's like you know, like, you know, when you're a little kid and you're in gym and you're, you're like waiting people to, like, pick you for, like, kickball. You know, that's really awkward, right? This is even more awkward. You don't know anybody. You're coming in here and you're like, you just kind of sit down. Newcomers always sit in the back, right? So you, you're like sitting as far away as you can. And then like, you're like, oh, someone's coming to me. What do I do, right? And, and so, but the thing is, if no one comes to you, you're like, Psh, what kind of church is this? <laughs> I'm never coming here again. <laughs> right? Like, how you're welcomed, how you are greeted, has a very big role in if you ever come back. And so actually there's there's studies on, on stuff like this, um, uh, like even not just welcoming itself, but like the presence that you feel when you enter into a room, right? Ch churches have not figured this out, but businesses have, especially like Starbucks. Starbucks puts a lot of research into this because what they understood is that customers within the first five minutes of entering into an establishment have already decided whether they're coming. And honestly, brothers and sisters, churches are the same way. That first five minutes of when someone comes into the door, especially if they don't know anybody, that plays a very, very big role on whether they ever return. All this other stuff, you know, worship, you know, this guy's talking and saying all this stuff, this stuff is very, very secondary to that first five minutes. 
And so I've always called worship, I, I have worship, I, I've always called welcoming team the frontline ministry. Because that's really where a lot of wars are won. So, you know, I just want to say, gatekeepers are important. It's all part of worship, right? So what this all shows us is that worship is a team effort, right? This passage talked about the priests. These are the guys that were, that were you know, teaching from the Word. And so you have your priests, you have your musicians, these people that are bringing people into the presence of God through music. But you have these people that are welcoming them in. And there's other Levites too. You have your treasurers, people that are taking care of the finances, making sure everything's okay. Right? You have all these different roles that are required. But what this shows us, brothers and sisters, is that worship, it's not just one or two individuals. It's a whole team. Even just like, you know, making these bulletins, giving to them, that's a good bulletin can encourage someone, right? There are bulletins sometimes you look at and your head hurts because there's like too much information. Like, what is all this? And, and like, even like giving announcements, I've heard of people that were like, like who were like blessed through, through announcements, not for me, but, but you know, just, just, just generally speaking, every aspect of a worship service, everything that's included, even the small, menial things, these all add up. It's a team effort. Right? Everyone needs to get involved. So for those of you that are serving, I want to encourage you guys. Whatever your role is, there's nothing small, there's nothing big. We're all serving together. Right? Continuing on. Now we're finally getting to the dedication of the wall. Now, it seems interesting because the wall was finished a while back, right? Time has now passed. But what happened was, first, they had to reconnect to the Word of God. And so we see they, they reconnected to the Word of God at least three times. And now that they've been transformed by the Word, now that they've been brought back into relationship with God, now they decide, now it's time to dedicate this wall. And really, when you look at the dedication, it's a huge worship service. You have two choirs that are like walking on these walls and they're just singing and worshiping God and then they come together and they go back into the temple and they, they just worship together, right? It's this huge procession. And the end result, and I, I love this verse because there's a repetition that keeps going on where it says, on that day they offer great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoice. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. The word joy is being repeated four times. What we see from this is that when people commit to worship, when people come together and they, they make this team that comes together to, to come into worship together, the end result is joy. Right? You could be going through a horrible day Terrible things can be happening to you, but if you really experience God through worship, everything changes. You will receive joy. Joy is not something that's dependent upon your circumstance, right? That's happiness. Happiness is something that changes, but joy is independent of what you're going through. Joy is related to who God is. So I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, when we really decide to focus on worship, that will lead to joyful living. And as the passage continued, it also shows that joy leads to generosity because, as the passage said, the gatekeepers and musicians, these are people that this was supposed to be their job, right? They could no longer live outside and live off the land and, and raise, you know, uh, you know animals and, and, and plants and vegetables. Like They couldn't do this anymore because their job was to focus on worship. They depended on the people to survive. But what we see is that this led to their provision. The passage talks about how because the people were so joyful, because they were so blessed, they committed to giving the daily portions. This was not just a, a once, you know, once here and there. This was a daily commitment to providing for the well-being for those that were committed to leading worship being a part of worship. So brothers and sisters, there is a commitment, a daily commitment, there is a cost. I'm going to take a random aside here, but uh, one of the interesting things I found is that 
worship, especially uh, like people that are like uh, worship leaders in Korea, or like they call it CCM in Korea. Um, I, I have to be careful with CCM because it means something different in English than it does in Korean. But regardless, um, people that are professional Christian musicians in Korea, it's very difficult. One of my friends, it's what he does, and he's one of the few that does it full time. And the only reason why he's able to do it full time is he's constantly touring. Because that's the only way he can actually earn money. Is when he goes and he gives a concert, you know, they, they give small honorariums, but he's able to sell some of his songs, his, his albums. Now, here's the thing is, he told me because he personally financed his albums. He, he used the money himself to make these albums. So whenever he did that, if he was able to sell albums, he got most of it for his own profit. But these days, young people don't pay for CDs anymore. Like, who has a CD player, right? And I think one of the things that, that troubles me more is, and I, I say this relatively often, but... Young people today don't understand what piracy is either, right? And especially when it's Christian. It's like, oh, it's Christian, then it's free, right? <laughs> it's like, and, and, so, and so it's like, the, brothers and sisters, people who make Christian music, they need to survive. And when we're, you know, pirating their MP3s, and brother, I actually, even listening to their music on YouTube, if it's not uploaded by them, that's technically piracy too. Brothers and sisters, that's robbing from them. These are people that need this to survive. And so I'm just, I'm just going to say this from the side. And, and I'm someone who was one of the worst piraters ever. <laughs> who gave it up because I was encouraged to. Um, but what I want you to understand is that support Christian artists. right? If you like their music, buy it. Right? Buy the MP3. I don't even really listen to CDs anymore. Buy the MP3. Stream the MP3. Right? You know, whatever it is. But we have to support those that have committed to do things that are related to worship. Right? And brothers and sisters, when we do so, when we commit to worship, when we commit to pay the costs, that actually leads to our joy. It's actually our privilege, right? There's nothing begrudging about supporting those that are worshiping the Lord. So I hope, brothers and sisters, that we can change our attitude in terms of what it means to, to, to really commit to worship. Is there is a time cost, but there's also a financial cost in terms of how we need to support those need. Now, just to give a very quick update, uh, we, we had a special offering two weeks ago for our sister Grace Lee. Just, just to let you know, we raised uh, 1.2 million won, and so I'm actually very proud of that. Um, and this is she's a she's a seminarian back in the states uh, who's, who's struggling financially, and so we've committed to raise offerings for her uh, once per year until she graduates. And so, just to let you guys know, we raised 1.2 million won, which is a pretty good sum for a small group. Um, but regardless, I'm thankful that many of you have taken to heart what it means to support those that are in ministry and those that are that desire to worship the Lord. So brothers and sisters, with that, let's seek to be joyful in our worship. As we come together as a body, and as we come together and sing songs, as we listen to the Word of God, as we spend fellowship, as we have Bible study together, but still with hearts of gratitude and joy. Knowing what God has given to us. And knowing that God wants to use us to support and encourage others. With that, let's take some time to pray. We're going to close for today. I want you to take a moment to just ask God, God, if there's anything that is hindering me from being joyful in your presence, if there's some type of distraction, some type of worry, some type of disappointment, whatever it might be, if there is something that is discouraging you from being joyful in the Lord, from having a heart that desires to worship Him, let's, take, let's ask God, God, reveal that to me and help me, Lord, to either let it go or to, to just give it to you, Lord so that I can renew myself and be joyful once more. So let's pray to God that we, He would help us to find the path to joy. Let's pray.
ask this really just pray that you would have hearts that desire to worship God because brothers and sisters if we're not worshiping God then we're definitely worshiping something else so let's just pray that we would remove whatever distractions there are and that if God is convicting us that in the heart of worship that he desires us to to support and to encourage those that are in the ministry of worship Let's pray that, that we would be able to do so willingly and joyfully. But let's first just pray that we would have a heart of worship toward God. Let's pray. And in that heart of worship, 